Hi guys, so I realized that I really did these peer-to-peer uh, -peer lectures backwards. When I planned uh, the course this semester, I had a plan and I, I think the plan was bad. So I'm going back to the original order, which is unstructured peer-to-peer, -peer, then structured peer-to-peer. -peer. And so today we'll do unstructured peer-to-peer -peer stuff. So, all right, so basically peer-to-peer -peer systems uh, can be divided into unstructured and structured. Structured we already covered, and then um, unstructured we have today, which is kind of an older set of systems, um, such as Napster, Nutella, uh, Kazaa, BitTorrent, and, and a couple middleware things. And um, what's interesting about them is that they were very performant they kind of started first they were the logical solution but they had this problem of finding content in a, in a decentralized way and that's where structured peer-to-peer -peer came in with things like cord and pastry and tapestry that um, allowed the routing through the distributed hash table to find the key that you want so um, here's kind of the spectrum of um, distributed systems you can have things ranging from client server through unstructured peer-to-peer -peer that have some sort of pattern connectivity to structured peer-to-peer -peer, which allow many many nodes uh, to connect efficiently okay and so th the idea behind peer-to-peer -peer is to uh, bring in more um, infrastructure into the system so if you have a client server architecture that client that server or that set of servers uh, is always going to be a bottleneck and so you as the owner of the application need to come up with an economic model such that you can afford all those servers. Um, so with peer-to-peer, -peer, people started thinking about infrastructure where the um, amount of compute or storage in the system scales in proportion with the number of um, participants in that system. So if everyone contributes resources as well as uses the system, there'll be, more, there'll be a balanced amount of resources in that system as opposed to the system bottlenecking on some uh, central server or a set of centralized servers okay um, and of course then people started looking at these peer-to-peer -peer systems in terms of also things like censorship resistance um, and availability and load balancing and um, the idea was that if we can organize these well if they're self-organized well then we'll be able to provide things like availability or load balancing or anonymity um, much more easily than in a centralized infrastructure okay and then the problems that these run into because they're not planned systems are things like node churn where nodes come in and out of the system and disrupt its structure and the system needs to kind of self-organize again to deal with node churn which is really constant so we're really talking about some rate of node churn okay? there's also lots of control overheads in these systems and so the question is how do we uh, implement the self-organization without the control overhead just taking over all the available bandwidth in the system with nothing being left for the actual service um, what to do with malicious nodes what to do with byzantine types failures when people try to bring the system down for the giggles of it um, and then also later on there were problems with how to support mutable objects and we already talked about ocean store which which found a nice elegant solution to that okay um so what are some current applications we kind of talked about it in terms of unstructured peer-to-peer -peer and or, or structured peer-to-peer -peer. and then for unstructured we had things like uh BitTorrent or basically lots of lots of file sharing things but um, there were other types of middleware as well, which we'll cover. Okay, so the first kind of big success of a distributed system was um, Napster. Um, and the idea there was to allow people to share um, files with each other. Okay, so um, the idea there was that the storage would still be provided by the different users on these kind of old iMacs such as the one I had in college um, and there would be some server which kept an index of where all the different files were okay so when looking for a file I would um, contact the Napster server say hey who has this file then I would get a list of peers and 
they would be presumably a lot of them in my college network so over a college network I could download the files I wanted relatively quickly and then once I had the file I could update the index like hey I also have this file so someone can get it from me and this was really unbelievably fast when it started when you were on a college campus um, and I mean it was wonderful <laughs> um, also illegal so eventually it got taken down by the fact that it was very easy for the recording industry to go to Napster and say hey you're participating in this even though you don't really hold the files you're still aiding and abetting and so you need to shut down the index servers and once those index servers were shut down, there was no way to find files. Um, and yeah, it was very easy to bring this to bring the system down, right? So as far as mechanism of this, you had a centralized database. Let me get a pointer. Pointer. <clears throat> you had a centralized database, um, which knew where all the files were you could join this network by registering yourself with the index server and telling it what files you have you would publish files by updating the index at the server searching was just contacting the server to query for it and then fetching was direct download from other nodes um, nearby okay um, so i mentioned that the system was very fast and the reason for this is that it was very relatively easy to have a set of servers to support to support indexing it's not a very difficult operation to support efficiently but the resources that the systems used to download the files which is really the bulk of the traffic that was all distributed against clients or among clients and so even though there was a centralized database it was used relatively rarely and the use was relatively light compared to all the traffic that was going between peers. Okay, so um, eventually this got Napster got faster. I guess well that was really the original design, but um, they replicated the index onto multiple servers with weak consistency. So because there were so many copies of files in the network. Um, even if a server didn't have all the locations of all the files, it could still provide you with like a hundred copies of the same file on nearby nodes. And so weak consistency was just fine for this. Um, you could also load balance downloads in this network because you would tend to select downloads from hosts that were nearby. And that meant within your local network, likely within your campus network. Um, so you would get good transfer rates from it because you were probably just downloading something from your roommate across the hall or across the room. Um, and the benefit of that also was that even if you were in a, let's say at home, at your parents' home back then and downloading stuff, you would still be downloading something from other people in your neighborhood by selecting them on lowest latency. And so there wasn't a lot of traffic going you know, all over the place. Like I wasn't downloading that much stuff from China. Okay, and so as far as pros, this was a simple mechanism, worked really well. Search scope was easy. It's just all of one, contact the server, get your answer. Um, the servers though had to maintain a fair amount of state. They did all the processing and they ended up being the single point of failure, which made it easy to bring Napster down. Um, yeah, which is... Uh, the pros and cons of privacy and deniability and content sharing. A lot of people got in trouble for Napster, even for down, you know, not just for hosting Napster, but for downloading stuff because um, you could find out what people had. All you had to do is query the content server and say, hey, where's this file? And it would give you the IPs of all the people that had that file, which, you know, <laughs> puts you just using Napster, put you in a lot of legal jeopardy. Okay, so <clears throat> after Napster was, sh was shut down, people were thinking, how do we keep the party going, um, but um, do it in a fully decentralized way? So just looking at the dates, Napster kind of started in 99, and then in 2000, uh, people came up with Nutella, which supported clients like LimeWire, Morpheus, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. 
And the idea there was to provide basically the same service, except without a centralized um, uh, index server, right? So if you needed to find something, you needed to basically send your query throughout this whole network of all the connected peers. So to join the network, um, you would find some neighbors, uh, maybe there was a list of nodes, you would kind of try to find nodes that were nearby you by pinging them and getting their list of neighbors. Okay. To publish something, you didn't need to do anything. You just kind of say, hey, I have a file stored locally. And then when someone wanted to find a file, they would send a query among the peers until something was found. So if a query got to you saying, like, hey, do you have this file? You can look in your own cache and say, yep, I have it. Or nope, let me forward the query to some of my neighbors to try to find it. Um, and then once you found, once you traverse this set of uh, peers in a network, you could, in the Nutella network, and you would find out that, okay, this guy has the file, you could set up a direct link with them to download it. So you wouldn't need to forward the traffic back through this uh, peering structure. Okay. Um, and what are some good strategies for neighbor selection? Well, this is kind of debatable. You can find peers that are nearby, um, right? So that's good for download stuff and it's gonna be fast to propagate queries, but you know, maybe they have the same content that you do. So this could be good and bad. If you wanna find something rare, then maybe you wanna diversify your connectivity with people who are not just on your campus. Um, you know, so people kind of talked about different, different ways of um, selecting peers in this network. Um, the way the search worked is that you would send a query saying, hey, where's this file? And it would be limited, uh, it would have a limited time to live, okay? So your query would propagate over some number of hops, and if it didn't find the file you were looking for, that query would just die. So if you didn't find something, you would need to reissue the query with a longer time to live, okay? So this mechanism Turned out worked pretty well for finding common stuff, but for finding needles in a haystack, um, you would need to retry your search multiple times and send it through all of the network, and then you, there would be lots of congestion in this network because everyone would be doing the same thing, or at least some of the time. Right? So searching was very, very slow. Um, people talked about different search approaches through this, uh, like expanding ring search, which is kind of like TTL, random walk, where you, your query packet only, there's only one of them, it doesn't get flooded, but it just keeps kind of follow, following the network randomly. So that would make it even slower, but possibly avoid some of the congestion or kind of gossiping between nodes about what they have. And that's something that was adopted in Kazaa, which we'll talk about in a sec, okay? So the pros of this was that it was a fully decentralized system. There was no way to, to take it down in the same way that Napster was taken down. Um, the search code, the search cost was distributed among all the nodes that participated in Nutella. Um, and then you could do kind of more powerful processing of the queries at each node. Um, in practice, that really wasn't used all that much. Um, so an expensive search, um, really no guarantees on how long the search took, especially that you might need to uh, reissue queries if they failed with low TTL. Um, and there was this other problem that because this network had no structure, um, nodes leaving and joining would be really disruptive and, and, and create disconnectivity or kind of poor connectivity in this randomly constructed overlay. Um, so connecting to a network was often took a long time before you got enough peers that, that you could actually have a pretty solid uh, connectivity. All right, to, so then to speed up the search, um, people kind of extended Nutella with this idea of super nodes, okay? And the idea there is that if your node has been stable and connected well for a while, then you can become a super node. Um, right? And what super nodes basically did is facilitate uh, the search. I'll explain that in a second, okay? So to join this network, you would join you would find a super node or find a neighbor who would then direct you to a super node and then you would join at that node. 
you would publish whatever files you have to a super node and then query would also be handled by the super nodes but the direct would be uh, the download would be direct now potentially from multiple peers so instead of downloading from one peer um, you could download in parallel from from multiple peers okay the way that you would advertise uh, your content was also kind of clever so let's say that you advertise something like chapter 10 on peer-to-peer -peer, okay so your object has four words in it and you can hash those words into four different hashes okay um, they used UU hash, but you could use something more secure. It's fine, right? Doesn't really matter. You end up with four hashes. Okay. So you would forward your queries for something like this, send those four hashes to a super node. Now the super node would have a list of all the different hashes. Okay. So here's the hashes for your stuff. Here's some hashes for someone else's stuff. And this all would be just a giant bag of hashes. So when you query, let's say I want to find chapter 10 or peer-to-peer, -peer, and you're setting these for hashes, the super node would say, yup, I have these four hashes in my bag. Um, and th then it could kind of tell you who provided what hashes. But this is also how the super nodes would exchange the hash, the, the contents of their directories with each other, right? So it could be that 65 and 47 come from one file, just chapter 10 on something else, and 09 and 76 come from, I don't know, chapter 5 on peer-to-peer -peer from another book, right? So your super node would still kind of think it has this content or it would advertise this content, but you would have to contact that super node directly to figure out if someone actually, if one of its clients actually advertised the four hashes that you were specifically looking for. Okay, so a little bit of giving up consistency when uh, super nodes communicated with each other on, on who has what content. Um, so nice thing about it is it started to leverage node heterogeneity, meaning that stable nodes got more responsibility in the system. Um, and then the super nodes also accounted for locality when returning search results, meaning that they would try to give you nodes to download from that were nearby. Okay. Um, this sped up the search, but there was still no guarantees on consistency um, or on the search scope, right? You could still have a pretty deep network, pretty big network of these nodes, uh, these super nodes. The only nice thing about it versus Nutella is that these nodes were more likely to be stable nodes that stuck around. Okay. Um, and then there was a lot of freeloading in that stuff. So that's kind of what collapsed Kazaz, that people would just try to download stuff without actually sharing any resources with the system. So it really wasn't self-scaling, which was one of the goals of peer-to-peer. -peer. Okay. So then BitTorrent... Um, was a nice solution to deal with this um, self-scaling problem. It basically came up with mechanisms to force people to contribute resources and avoid freeloading. Well, to a large extent, there's some ways to, to get around it. Okay. Um, it also wanted to solve this problem of if something becomes really popular and everyone wants to download that content, how do we quickly spread it throughout the network to um, make sure that there's more and more copies of that thing so more and more people can download that popular content more efficiently. Okay, So BitTorrent basically provided a way to, to download content, but it didn't provide a directory to find where that content is. For that, you needed a separate system called the tracker. Okay, So to publish something, you would run a tracker server or connect to a tracker server, and then you would say, hey, there's... There's this content and there are shards of that content on different peers. Okay, so I guess I should have mentioned that a content would be divided into shards and then those shards would be distributed. So here's a file, it's divided into these shards and when clients start downloading this content, they take up a random shard and then once these two nodes have a shard, they can communicate it with each other. Right? So eventually most of the traffic is between peers and not with the original publisher. Okay, so search would be out of band. Um, join, you would get a list of peers from the tracker that have 
shards for the content you're looking for and then fetching was a direct shard exchange with peers. Now what made BitTorrent cool, or it makes it cool, it's still a used system, um, is uh, the tit-for-tat sharing strategy. Okay, so what would happen is that um, nodes would basically download from um, n fastest peers. Okay, so if I'm downloading something uh, from two peers and one of them is faster than the other, then I'm going to allow the faster peer to up to download data from me at a faster rate or more often. Okay, so if someone's sharing data with me, I will share it with them, thereby creating this incentive. <clears throat> but how to get this started when no one has any data? Well, they also introduced this mechanism called opportunistic unchoking. And what that means is that peers would um, opportunistically or randomly unchoke a peer and allow that peer to download some content from it. Okay? This also allows new peers to join the network when they don't have any content yet to share, so they can't be judged if they're a, a good peer or not. Right? And so let's say I don't have any content, I, down, I connect to some peers, one of them opportunistically allows me to download something, I say, okay, cool, I download that. And then as soon as I download it, that peer would ask me for that stuff again, just to judge how, how good I am at uploading stuff. Okay, and if I'm willing to upload, then they would unchoke the rate some more. Okay, so this also allows nodes to periodically try to download something from a new peer and see if they can get better bandwidth from the peer and potentially switch to them. And right? so two nice mechanisms for creating incentives for nodes to um, share their upload resources with the rest of the network. Okay. So big difference from Napster is that even though we're downloading from peers, we're downloading from multiple peers, not just one. We're downloading um, chunks of files, not whole files from, from different peers. Um, the trackers are separated from, um, from the file holder, so there's nothing to shut down. I mean, I guess you can set a, shut down a tracker, but those have been really easy to bring up again. Um, and there's even extensions to allow to run to allow trackers to run through distributed hash tables, right? Which we already discussed. So then there's really nothing to shut down. Um, the focus of the system is on providing large files, so it's not so much used for for music or hasn't been. It's more for like games and videos. Um, and the anti-freeloading mechanisms work really nice, even though you could, in theory, well, in practice too. If there's a lot of peers just kind of mooch of the opportunistic unchoking to download your file. Okay. Um, yeah, so it works well in practice, um, has incentives mechanisms built in, um, and the cons of it is always trying to find the right tracker that has the content or dealing with the DHT, which can be pretty slow. Okay. Um, one of the other systems that kind of came out of this unstructured work um, is Tor, or the Onion Router, which is a pretty cool idea developed, I believe, by the Navy um, to help spies, which is cool, except, well, I guess it is cool, but now we all get to use it <laughs> um, to circumvent government surveillance. So the way this works is that um, we have some sort of peers in the network that are participating in this um, in this tour system and let's say that alice wants to send a message to bob or bob provides a server that alice wants to connect to okay so alice would pick a random number of peers in this tour network and get their private they get their public keys now when alice wants to send a message to bob she takes the message and wraps it in the public, encrypts it with the public key of router C, and of router B, and of router A. Okay, so the A is on the outside. So then Alice sends the message to uh, this peer A. The peer A can decode it because uh, using his private key because that's the outside encryption. And then it gets the message, the green message, and it doesn't can't decode it. So it sends it to the next peer. Well, I guess. Um, it also has to know what is the next peer in the system. Okay, so it sends it to the next peer. That peer can decode it. 
but now the red message sends the red message to, to this node and the red message then is decoded and transmitted to Bob. Okay, so at this point, Bob knows where the message came from if that, mess, if that information was actually embedded in the message, not otherwise. And anybody trying to snoop in on this network, let's say you compromise this node, well, what would you know? You would be able to decode the green message, but the red message is still encrypted. And so you don't really know what it is. And you don't really know where it came from other than it came from the previous node, right? So there's no way for, for you with the information you have here to track this message back to Alice. And so it's a pretty nice system. There's some uh, uh, extensions to, to the Onion router called Garlic that's even more secure. Um, you can get this stuff to work in your browser. Um, you can download a specialized browser for that stuff if you need to do private communications for any reason. I highly recommend you guys um, dig into this and see if there are any more recent exploits and what people are doing about it because I know there were a lot of attacks on it and some of them were successful and later systems kind of got around it. Um, all right, so here's a quick summary of unstructured versus structured peer-to-peer. -peer. So the advantages of unstru unstructured is that it's self-organizing and kind of naturally resilient to node failure just because it's a mess. So one node failing, who cares? <laughs> um, but it's difficult to provide any guarantees on locality of objects and you're going to have lots of messaging because there's no structure to how search messages are being sent. Structured peer-to-peer, -peer, specifically distributed hash tables, um, are guaranteed to locate objects um, if they exist. Well, subject that some of the search, some percentage of search of searches can fail. Um, there's some sort of time and complexity bounds on searching. Um, and it's not going to have as much congestion as unstructured peer-to-peer. -peer, okay? But the downside is that you need to have all the control traffic to maintain the structure, the ring of the of the distributed hash table. Um, and in highly dynamic environments where you have lots of nodes, not lots of nodes joining and leaving, um, you can end up with with ring breakage or lots of traffic to reconstruct the routing table, which doesn't happen so much in um, unstructured peer-to-peer -peer because you're just trying to connect to some nearby nodes and any type of connection is really fine in that type of system. All right, so that brings us to the end of the peer-to-peer -peer discussion. I hope you guys enjoyed it and uh, I will talk to you again on Monday. Cheers.